Greetings. It's great to be here at, at Bethel for um, a Monday Thursday uh, service, you know, a service where we, we celebrate uh, many the many events that happened in this week of Holy Week, um, including uh, the, the breaking of bread and the taking in and very in the wine and the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, and we're going to be doing that through song, uh, through through the readings, and, and through a message. Uh, historically here at Bethel, Monday Thursday is when we did First Communion um, for our, our youth, but we are going to move that program into the fall because we're figuring out a way to make it inclusive for all of our different language groups and, and include it in one of our, kind of our joint services, possibly Reformation Sunday, so we're going to... But, that's one of the many things we have to, to juggle and now at Bethel as we grow together as one. So, uh, But for those that, this is one of my favorite services of the whole year, especially the, the, the stripping of the altar at the end. I mean, it, it gives me goosebumps. So for those that are gathered here tonight, um, whether it's online or in person, um, we're so glad that you are here. Uh, this kind of kicks off the, the weekend that is um, the, towards the end of Holy Week as we Get ready tomorrow night to, to go to the cross for the Good Friday Tenebrae service and um, celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday. So with that in mind, uh, we ask you to stand as we uh, sing our opening hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane, number 436. gather this evening in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Christ Jesus took a hold of me. The Lord bless you and keep you. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. He blessed the bread. He blessed the cup. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. The bread we break is a participation in the body of Christ. He broke the bread. Give, and it will be given to you. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Return to me with all your heart, says the Lord, with prayer and fasting, with weeping and mourning, with broken and contrite hearts. For the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Christ's body was broken, for, broken in death for you. His blood was shed for your redemption. O oh God, in your kindness, have pity. O oh God, in your mercy, wash away our sins. Cleanse us from the stain of the guilt of the sins we cannot forget and those that we cannot remember. We have not loved you with our whole heart soul, and mind. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We deserve your wrath and punishment. For the sake of Jesus Christ, turn your eyes from our iniquity and cover our guilt, that we may know again the joy of your salvation. Friends, I have good news, for you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you are redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from our forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. It is for his sake that I declare to you the full forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. O Lord, our God. In holy baptism, you have called us to be Christians and granted us the remission of sins. Make ready to receive the most holy blood of Christ for the forgiveness of all our sins. And grant us grateful hearts that we may give thanks to you, O Father, to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Our first reading is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor, and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Join me in the responsive reading of Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation, and I will call the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all. 
all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You cannot lose my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. of the house of the Lord in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Our epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians 11, 23-32. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. Then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may be may not condemn along with the world. That's the reason.
mercy, and peace be from God as we meditate on this word and may this meditation be pleasing in his sight. Amen. Prove it. How many times do you hear those words? All the time, right? Prove it. We're always asked for proofs. School, you're asked for proofs, right? Certain math, certain science, certain... I always hated those assignments that involved proofs. I, I deal more in the abstract than the theoretical myself. But no, we're all asked at different times. Life is full of having to prove things, right? Prove, prove your point. Prove your argument. In the, in the court of law, we see, we see that played out, you know, and we'll definitely see it played out even tomorrow night as we read the Passion account of our Christ. Prove it. Prove you're the Son of God. Prove this. Prove that. We're often forced to make a decision based on who, provi who provides the best proof, the best argument, the, the closest to the proof. And yet, sometimes... It's proving something is challenging. There's a lot of things that happen, a lot of things that go on that are very difficult to prove. Certainly to prove beyond a shallow shadow of a doubt. So the, our, our title for our message this morning, The Proof of Love, is an example of that. And that even that phrase can be can be read a couple of different ways. Once, you can say, well, the proof of love. So the, the proof of love is how you prove love, right? So you, you buy flowers. You write cards. You, you do nice things for someone. You, um, you, you do sacrificial things for someone. You make sacrifices. You do things to people, whether it's a spouse, a child, a good friend, a parent. You do these things things, these actions, these words to prove love. I'm proving my love. But there's another way to read this, right? Because the proof of something, right, is the thing that, that shows what it is. So what does love prove? It's another way you could read this, another way you could look at that. So what, what is love the proof of? What, what do acts of love prove? And I think we're going to see, even in our text this evening, this Monday, Thursday text, Jesus kind of using this both ways. He's both proving his love, but he's also showing us what love is the proof of. You see, during his last supper, and there's, Monday Thursday is such a rich evening. I wish we could have four services just dedicated to Monday Thursday because there's so much going on. There's Jesus washing his disciples' feet. There's um, all these stories that he's telling, especially in John, the, the vine and the branches, and then, you know, and um, the, the obviously the interaction with, with, the, with the Lord's Supper and how that goes down, and then him in the, in the, in the, the garden, you know, just crying out, hey, God, Father, if you got a plan B, I'm ready to hear it. And yet your will, not my will be done, but yours. So even picking a, a, a topic or reading a, a, a part of that evening to focus on for a message is, is a challenge. But I think here tonight we want to kind of look at this idea of proof. What is the proof of love? Um, what, and, and how is Jesus demonstrating? How is Jesus teaching that? Because during this last supper with his disciples, Jesus challenges and still challenges his disciples to prove it. Prove love. He offers them the proof of love. And what Jesus is doing here is he's showing them and showing us that disciples show the proof of love the same way Jesus did, by proving it like Jesus. So let's look at this text today. I ask you to rise for the reading of the gospel, which is from John chapter 13. Um, and as I read this, be thinking about how is, 
How are these two realities being played out? How is Jesus showing the proof of love, the, the way that you prove love, but also how is he showing what love proves? This is right after he washes his feet. So if you kind of are wrapping your brain around what's going on here, he's, he's um, in the middle of washing his disciples' feet. And then he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one I send. That's the end of that previous reading. And then he goes on to say these words. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified. Truly, truly, sometimes translated verily, verily. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will be training. The disciples looked at one another Uncertain of whom he spoke, one of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table closest to Jesus, like in the famous painting, of course. Um, so Simon motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him and Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do it quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, by what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. Now, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the son of man glorified and God glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, I will now also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you. The word Monday Thursday comes from the Latin word for mandate, mandatinium, which means command, right? So a new command I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. All right, so how does Jesus then do this? How does he demonstrate the proof of love or the, the proof of what love is? How does he do that tonight in our readings? He does it a couple of ways. The first thing he does is prove it himself. He demonstrates it. Now, I think all of us can agree with this. The most influential teachers, the most influential leaders in our lives are people that not only teach things or communicate things effectively, but they actually live out what they communicate. They back it up with actions. The people that are the kind of the do as I say, not as I do people, it's a little bit harder to follow them. But if we see people that are willing to work hard and get in the trenches and do the very thing that they're asking others to do, that's the kind of leader we want to follow. That's one of the things I think that we admire about Jesus is that he never asks his disciples to do something that he's not willing to do himself. He says the first shall be last and the last shall be first and he always puts them first. He washes their feet. He says to them very, very challenging things, but he always backs them up with what he does. So, Tonight, he does a couple of things, several things throughout the evening, but two that I want to focus on that proves it himself. He proves his love, and he shows what love is the proof of. First of all, by washing their feet. An act of total humility, an act of total love. But, and, that, and that's a pretty obvious one. 
But there's one in our text directly that's a little more subtle. You got to kind of dig a little to pay attention to it and see it there. But it, it seen, it's found in this interaction between him and Judas. You know, Judas make, he, Jesus makes this bold statement of saying that one of you will betray me. And you got to think, put yourself in that, in that, in that room. You know, the, the, the disciples are wondering, is, is that me? Who's he talking about? Who's Jesus talking about? Who could it possibly be that's going to betray me? Who could this person be? And then it says, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at the table close to Jesus. So he was sitting closest to Jesus. You know the old joke, um, what was the last thing Jesus said after the Lord's Supper was, can everybody get on this side of the table for the picture? You can laugh, it's not that bad. You're killing my momentum here. No, um, so G, no and, and then John, who we believe is the one that he loved, is, is the one that is, that's usually represented there, is sitting closest to Jesus, and Simon Peter kind of motions to him to ask Jesus who is speaking, and then he leans back against Jesus and said, whom was it? And Jesus answers, but answers only where John can hear, because later people, they're still confused about it. It is he who I give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So insider information that helps John, because when he's writing his account of the gospel, he gives this detail, but not kind of you know, throwing Pete, you know, throwing Judas under the bus either, or, or or singling him out to anyone to other than John, and then he does. He gives him the, the morsel, and then he tells him to go do what what he, he came to do after he dipped it, and then after he took the morsel, it says Satan entered him, and that and Jesus commands him or directs him to go go ahead and go do what you're going to do, knowing that he's going to get the soldiers to come arrest. Jesus. Okay, so all that's well and good. So how is Jesus proving love to his disciples in this? How is he demonstrating this? Put yourself in Jesus' situation for a second. You're having dinner with your closest friends, the people that you're closest to in the world, and you have insider information. You know that one of them has already made a deal with the authorities to sell you out. How would you be towards that person at that meal? Would you be like Jesus and treat them like you would any other time? Would you offer them the morsel? Would you, would you not rat them out in front of the whole group? Would you be calm and, and even say, go do what you need to do? I don't know if I would. Be cold. I'd be, I may even rat, may even just tell everybody, hey, this guy, you know, or I, I would make it very uncomfortable for that person. Probably not even realizing I was doing it. It'd be hard. This is one of those hard teachings of Jesus that he actually models, right? Jesus says what? So what that people love those who hate them or love those that treat them badly? Big deal. Everyone does that. You want to be my follower, treat those who treat you poorly. Treat those who hate you. Treat those who sell you for a few pieces of silver with the same love and dignity that you treat everybody else with. That's a proof of love. That's also what love proves. It proves what kind of person Jesus is and what kind of kingdom he is the king of. Of, and it looks very different than what we see most of the time in the world. So, sparing Judas of additional guilt and shame, even in the other gospel accounts, we see that Jesus even gives him communion. He even offers him his very body and blood, knowing what is to Come Now, much has been written about this whole interaction between Jesus and Judas and, and what was the fate of Judas and, and, you know, and all that. And that, that. Tonight is not about dealing with that, but it is to show that before Jesus challenges his disciples with this command to prove love and to show the, the proof of love, he proves love. 
by showing love to the one who's going to betray him. And later, he's going to show love to the one who denies him three times by restoring him back into the group. So first thing Jesus does is that he proves love. He shows the proof of love. And he shows them what that looks like to prove love in the most difficult of circumstances. Um, a story came out of, of the, uh, the, the recent, con the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine that, that kind of demonstrates this. Um, this. As the story goes, this, and, you know, and the battle was, was, was taking place on one of the border towns between Russia and the Ukraine, and um, it was a part of the Ukraine where they mostly speak Russian, but and the, the, a lot of the people there are bilingual, like you would see in a, in a border town. And the, the story goes that they are, they, 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 the Ukrainian army have, have gathered some prisoners, um, this, and, they're, and they're sitting outside someone's house. So you imagine you know, having prisoners of war, like kind of sitting in your front yard or whatever. And one, the mother comes out, and her own son, who's fighting in another part of the country for the Ukraine, one of the Russian soldiers kind of reminds him of, reminds her of her own son. And she reaches out to him, and they, and they, and they, they both speak this, they, she reaches out to them knowing a little Russian, and, and they're and they starting to have a conversation. And then she ends up calling the soldier's mom to tell the mom that her soldier's okay. He's been captured, but he's, he's fine. That's the kind of love that Jesus is, is asking us to demonstrate. That, that kind of, you know, this is the, the, a soldier who's fighting against your country, but the, this love for a mother to her own son would say, this is what I, if my son were to be captured, I'd hope that mom would call me. And that's what I'm going to do. That's the kind of love he's talking about here. So before he challenges them, he, he proves it himself. But the second thing he does, he does challenge them. He says, a new command I give you. A new commandment I give you. He says, he calls them little children. He says, I'm not going to be with you much longer. You can't go where I'm going. I'm going to the cross for the sins of the world. That is not a place you can go. So he says, a new command I will give you, love one another just as I have loved you. And that this will be the proof that you are my disciples, is that you have love for one another. So what is the proof of love? Well, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, show the proof of love by loving like Jesus and that is both the proof of love, but that's also how we prove our love, by imitating Christ. That is how people will know that we follow Jesus. So what about us? Where is our proof? How good are you, how good is your pastor at proving He's a disciple of Jesus by the way he loves people. I gotta admit with, I gotta be honest with you. If I look back at even some of the conversations I've had this very week, I'm pretty embarrassed that a person who follows Jesus would say those things, would think those things, would act in that way. And I'm sure every one of us gathered here feels the same way. But luckily, even when we fail to prove our love and when we fail to prove our discipleship, our following of Jesus by acting in love, we have one who proved his love all the way to the cross. And that inspires us not to want to love or to do these things in order to gain God's favor, but because God has already given us his favor in the, in the sacrifice of Jesus. So once again, as disciples of Jesus, we show the proof of love 
by loving the way Jesus did. Especially when it's hard. Amen? Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace. You've got our Father. Amen. We continue with our worship by sharing our words of our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I ask you to stand. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, like very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, for who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried. On the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God. And he will come again from the glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with our offerings. Um, we, ask you, we, we thank you again for all your ongoing support of Bethel, allowing us to even have this Newly remodeled sanctuary. There's a place, there's a table in our, in our welcome center slash narthex where you can, and on your way out, where you can drop off an offering if, if you're not giving online or, or via the mail. And while we have a chance to reflect on all the offerings, all the things that God has given us, um, we have uh, this wonderful offering um, from our voices of prayers.
We stand for prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come to you mindful of the incredible way that you proved your love to us. Father, you sent your Son. Son, Jesus, you died for our sins. And Jesus, you send your Spirit to dwell in us and help us live out this love. As we wrestle with what does it mean to prove our discipleship, prove our love, prove, show proof for who we are in, in relation to you. We pray on behalf of those needing prayers. We pray on behalf of Jean back in the hospital for Sharon, Sharon's granddaughter, Olivia, for the, the family of the, the lenses, Boren, and for the family that are all families that are dealing with death, the Harringtons and others in this world, the, the, the people that are dying daily because of war, because of conflict, because of, because of um, all the disasters that are in the world. Uh, we pray for the work of our spiritual leadership team. We pray that hearts will be softened towards you. Uh, we pray for one Bethel. So we pray for those that attend our English services, for our families that gather for chapel uh, on Wednesdays, for our Kenya Wanda speaking and Spanish speaking brothers and sisters. We pray for those who specifically uh, are remain on our prayer list. We pray for Marilyn, for Katie, for Bill, for David, for Mel, for Sharon, for Cindy, for Michelle, for Jack, for Kenneth, for Mark, for Mary, for John, for Risa, for Ruth, for Sean, for Kevin, and for Ruth. And we pray that all of our disciples here at Bethel will continue to demonstrate our love and the way that we worship, the way that we grow in the way that we serve and the way that we care. Father, we, on this night where you did come, where your son did break the bread and share the wine with his disciples, help us to be prepared as we come to the table to receive these many gifts that you give us. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.
We gather as his disciples. The bread is shared. The cup is passed. The precious body and blood of Christ are partaken. Our sins are washed away. Our souls are nourished and strengthened. Our lives are renewed. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Come, you followers of Christ, and lift up your hearts. We come and lift them to the Lord. Come, you followers of Christ, come. Let us come to the table of the Lord. Taught by Jesus, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now let us hear the account of how this sacrament began. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread and blessing it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples with the words, This is my body, it is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later he took a cup of wine, saying, This is my blood of the new covenant. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. So now following Jesus' examples and command, we take the bread of this and the wine, the ordinary things of the world, which Christ has made extraordinary.
stand for the blessing. As we pray, blessed Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, you have given yourself to us in this holy sacrament. Keep us in the faith and the favor that we may live in you, even as you live in us. May your body and blood preserve us in the true faith to life everlasting. Here, for the sake of your holy name, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. During our closing hymn, as is the tradition on Monday, Thursday, uh, the members of the altar guild will strip the altar. Um, this is symbolic of the abuse that Jesus would endure beginning shortly after uh, the institution of this meal. And for those of you that are able to gather uh, with us tomorrow at Good Friday, uh, you will notice a stripped, uh, stripped altar area. Um, I encourage you to wear black um, for a Good Friday service and um, just uh, when we will exit in, in, in solemn mood this evening. Thank you.